if you remember, this is going to be a little bit of a test. I'm throwing it in there. <laughs> this was one of a carry-on, tack-on to the first one he ever did here. Yes, this is part two to the very sermon I gave here, actually. And I'm not sure why I waited this long to give part two. But certainly the Lord has made everything beautiful in his time. Um, today's message, entitled The Rise of the Third Angel's Message and the Book of Joel. Um, what I have here, the first few slides actually, are a review of the very first sermon I gave here. I think that's been many now years ago. Years ago. Um, so I have a few slides, PowerPoint slides here to review, just to bring back certain things to your remembrance, and then we'll get into today's message. Uh, but before we begin, let's have a word of prayer. I'm going to kneel. You're more than invited to join me, or if you'd like to just bow your heads where you're seated. Father in heaven, we just thank you now for this time to study your word. We ask and invite your Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us into all truth. I pray and ask that you would bring back to remembrance everything that you've said to me, and that you'd bless the ears of those who hear today. In Jesus' name I pray and ask and for his sake. Amen. The first sermon I gave here so many years ago was entitled The Day Approaches. And I spoke regarding the second coming of Christ, the second advent. And when we look at the second advent of Christ, it always helps to look at the first advent because history often repeats itself. And that's what we did last time. And we spoke regarding a certain faithful group that the Bible says were blameless and walking in all the commandments of God. And that faithful group consisted of Elizabeth, Zacharias, Joseph, Mary, the wise men, the shepherds, and others there, Simeon, Anna. And we know that they studied the prophecies of Christ's coming. They studied Daniel chapter 9, Micah chapter 5, and Numbers 24. So they were studying the prophecies. And the SDA commentary actually says this regarding this small group as they were studying the prophecies. This is what the commentary actually says. However, the devout in Simeon's day had the assurance from the prophecies that their generation would see the Messiah. That's SDA Commentary, Volume 5, page 702. So from a study of the prophecies, the commentary is here saying that they had the assurance that their generation would see the coming Messiah. And the question begs to be asked, what does that mean? You know, does that mean that their children would see the coming Messiah, or that their great-grandchildren or their great-great-great-grandchildren? Like, what does that mean? You know, can we break it down a little bit? Well, I certainly believe that you know, the Bible and the Lord says what he means, and what he means he says. We know that Simeon himself was promised by the Holy Ghost that he would not see death until what? He saw the Lord's Christ, and he came by the Spirit into the temple, and he recognized Jesus as he's being dedicated. John the Baptist had the assurance that upon whom he sees the Holy Spirit descend as a dove, it is he that baptizes with the Holy Spirit and with fire. The wise men, the shepherds, they had the assurance. They said, let us go now unto Bethlehem and see this great thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. They had the assurance that they themselves would see the coming Messiah. That's what the prophecies assured them. That's what the commentary here itself says. So the question I ask to you is this, is it possible for us through a study of the prophecies to have the same assurance as to whether or not we're living in the generation which would witness Christ, not his first coming, but what? Yes, his second coming. Is it possible? Is there anywhere in the Bible where Jesus says, when you see all these things come to pass, know that his coming is what? Nigh at hand, even at the door, and that what? This generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. So likewise, the Bible is consistent. So through a study of prophecies, we, as they, might have the assurance as to whether or not we're living in the generation which witness Christ, again, not his first coming, but his second coming. And this is here from Luke 21, Jesus himself speaking. So likewise, when you see these things, Come to pass, know that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Verily or surely, I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. And this is also not only what 
that small faithful group believed, but also the pioneers understood that through a study of prophecy, they may know as to whether or not they would be living in the generation which would witnessed Christ coming or not. And this is actually from J.N. Lomborough's book. And I have this book here. This is an excellent read on the history of the church. I have a few of my uh, slides, my quotations from this book. It's excellent. I highly recommend it. Sister White called into the ministry. And um, he was very good friends with uh, Brother James and Sister White. And this is what he said. In this scripture, our attention is directed to the time when it is possible to learn that the coming of Christ is at the doors with the same assurance that we know that summer is near when we see the first tender young leaves putting forth. It may also be known that we have come to the generation which would not pass off the stage of action until Christ himself shall come. So that's what he wrote in his book, page 93. And other pioneers, and I'm only going to show this one quotation from Uriah Smith. Perhaps I'll actually stick with the highlighted portion for time's sake. The question is asked, but when is this kingdom to be established? We've always been asking that question ever since Christ came the first time. The disciples asked, so when are you coming? When are you going to be back? When are you going to set up your kingdom? It's always been asked, right? The word of God does not leave us in ignorance. We do not say that the exact time is revealed. In brackets, we emphasize the fact that it is not, either in this or in any other prophecy. But so near an approximation is given that the generation which would see the establishment of this kingdom may mark its approach what? Unerringly. In other words, it's a no-brainer. And he says here, and make that preparation which will entitle them to share in all its glories. Now, the slide I have here are some of the signs that Jesus said to look for prior to his coming. And I think many of us are familiar with these signs. We've, we've exhausted them. We've read them over in the great controversy. We know them like the back of our hand. And some of those signs were the times of the Gentiles or the great tribulation, which is known as the dark ages. I have the date there. The great earthquake, which John says not in his gospel, but in Revelation 6 under the sixth seal. He says there's a great earthquake. That was the great Lisbon earthquake of 1755. Signs of the sun and moon we know occurred in 1780 right here in New England. And the stars shall fall from heaven. The meteor shower of 1833, which took place in the days of the pioneers. I think Sister White was about five years old when that took place. So these were the signs that Jesus gave. And regarding the last sign, the stars falling from heaven, the meteor shower of 1833, Sister White writes this. She says this. Thus was displayed the last of those signs of his coming, concerning which Jesus bade his disciples, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. After these signs, John beheld as the great event next impending, the heavens departing as a scroll, while the earthquake, the mountains and islands removed out of their place, and the wicked in terror sought to flee from the presence of the Son of Man. So here, after the meteor shower, what was seen was the events regarding the seventh plague, the islands and the mountains being moved. And the question I often ask is this. If that was the last sign that Jesus had to look for prior to his coming, and then he says, this generation shall not pass, what's my question? Why has like 170 or 80 plus years passed by, right? Why, how come, why has that happened? I mean, did prophecy fail? I guess maybe prophecy is not entirely correct, right? Or what happened? What exactly transpired? Isn't that strange? So what took place? And this is the question that might be asked you because someone might come to you and say, I understand these prophecies. Why is it this the case? What does he mean? What took place? What's going on there, you know? So this is a question that might be asked you, and this is the question we're asking now. And this is why it's important to do as the prophet Isaiah says. The word of the Lord was unto them, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line. Here a little, there a little. So when we study the prophecies regarding Christ's coming, we don't just study from one chapter in the Bible and then that's it. We have to do what? Search other places. We have to look at Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark 13 also Revelation chapter 6, because there might be one sign which is mentioned by one author of the gospel, right? And the other one doesn't mention, like the Apostle John mentions a great earthquake in Revelation 6, the great Lisbon earthquake, which the other ones, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, don't talk about. So this is why it's important to really study the Bible in its entirety. So we have here, and if you look at Luke chapter 21, verse 25, Luke talks about another sign after the stars falling from heaven. He says what? And upon earth, the stress of nations, right? With perplexity. And this was 
a sign that he said was to follow the stars falling from heaven. Matthew doesn't talk about that. We saw before. Only Luke mentions this sign. So the question is, what event is this sign pointing to? Because we saw that the other signs were specific events in history, right? There have been many earthquakes in the history of humanity, but one fulfilled the prophetic criteria. There's been many kind of like eclipses, but one meant the prophetic criteria for 1780. There have been many kind of like earthquakes and different things, but it's a specific event that these signs are pointing to, you see. So my question is, what event is this sign actually referring? What does the great controversy have to say about it? We know the other ones. We exhausted them. We can rattle them off not even thinking, right? But what is this sign pointing to? We know the other ones. What does the great controversy actually have to say about it? And this is important because this is why it's important to be diligent Bible students, especially Seventh-day Adventists, to share with others the soon coming of the Lord. This is why it's important to know these things because the coming of the Lord is at hand. And so basically, what we have here is Sister White's writings. This is what she says regarding that specific sign. This is what she says. In the time of distress and perplexity of nations, there what? There will be what? Will be, will be many, etc. In the what? Future, there will be broken thrones and great distress of nations with perplexity. So one of the reasons why Sister White doesn't connect a specific event with this sign in the great controversy or in any of her writings is because why? What? It's ongoing, but also what tense does she use here? In what? It it's future. It's will be. You see, she says here, she actually tells you in the future there will be. I mean, this could be one reason why that Jesus did not what? Come in the days of the pioneers, because prophecy was not yet entirely fulfilled. You see? Could certainly be the case. So the question next is asked, so what event is this sign pointing to? This becomes like our unfinished homework to do. You see, it's not enough to stand on the shoulders of godly men and women who fasted and prayed and studied the Bible and did all this work and then just say, well, we're just going to stand upon their shoulders and do nothing more, you see. Because truth and light is what? It's progressive. You see, when we look at medicine, you know, there's always new things that are discovered, new treatments and new diagnostic modalities that are coming up. In any field, there's always increasing knowledge. And by the time something's printed out, it's obsolete because something new's popped up. Could it be possible that there's increasing light that, of course, will not contradict old light, but truth is progressive? So the question we need to find out is, what is this sign actually pointing to? Because has it yet transpired in our day? Truth is progressive. The earnest seeker will be what? Constantly receiving light from heaven for time's sake, the highlighted portion. The truth is an advancing truth, and we must walk in the increasing light. Now, when the disciple... And the physician Luke talks about upon earth distress of nations with perplexity. There's always been many distresses of nations in the past history of humanity. But this is referring to a specific event like the other signs we're talking about. These are specific events. And the word perplexity, actually, if you look at a Greek lexicon, it's an ancient Greek word which actually means, and I have it here. This is not meant to be read, but just to show you. It means to be ruined by creditors. It means to be without resources or revenue or be in a bankruptcy state. So there's a what kind of connotation to it? It's a financial economic connotation to it, you see? And they give examples of how the word was used in the past history. It's a Greek and it has a financial connotation. In fact, this is also from another lexicon. Difficulty of passing, straits, no way out. To be with lack of means, resources, or revenue perplexity, perhaps where the translator got the word from, and poverty. So we putting pieces together to figure out what this actually might mean. So the question I ask is this, when has there been upon earth the stress of nations with lack of wealth, no way out, ruined by creditors, bankruptcy state, being at an impasse, lack of resources or revenue or poverty? And that's the question I present to you, when has that taken place? When has this event taken place? Because obviously you're still future from the days of the pioneers. Sister White said, in the future there will be. So we're 180 years into the future now. So let's look back on history and see. You see, the Philadelphia church, and perhaps you remember the history of Josiah Litch, right? Studying Revelation 9 and the Ottoman Empire. It fell on August 11, 1840. He predicted that two years prior. And he went around preaching it. And when it actually came to pass on the very same day that the Ottoman Empire fell, 
Thousands of people joined the Adventist church. They said, you guys know what you're doing. You know, you're studying the prophecies. Your understanding of prophecy is correct. So they were very diligent Bible students in the latest, in the Philadelphian church. But today, God's people are not even aware of the sign which Luke mentions. They're not even aware of it. They don't proclaim it in advance. When it comes to pass, they don't even recognize it. And when someone brings it to their attention, what do they say? What do they say? You're, from the, you're a date setter. No man knows the day or the hour. This is why Laodicea is Laodicea. Completely clueless, you see. But there's still hope. So praise the Lord for that. So the question is this. When has this taken place? What event in history might fulfill the prophetic criteria? And very often it's been asked and suggested that perhaps the Great Depression might actually fit that. But we know that the Great Depression primarily took place where? Geographically. In most of the United States. So it didn't quite. It says, upon earth distress of nations. Plural. Plural. So when has this actually taken place? So you might be interested to know. Now remember, aporia is a Greek word with a financial or economic connotation. The Greek finance minister said after a recent event, he wrote in a book. He said in his book, and I have it here that the nations of the earth have entered into a state or a period of aporia. The Greek finance minister used the same word as Luke. Remember, all that prophecy has foretold has been what? Traced on the pages of history. If it's not proclaimed in advance, you can just look back on history. Okay, here it is. Prophets and Kings, page 537. All that prophecy is foretold as coming to pass until the present time has been what? Traced on the pages of history. So sometimes if you want to know what prophecy said when it was fulfilled, just look back on history. And sometimes the newspapers will figure it out before God's people. Apparently that's what happened in the days of Christ when he first came. You know, the church then completely over their head. And then the wise men came, you know, from the east over there. You know, they weren't even part of the proper church there. And this is why history has a tendency of repeating itself, you see? And this is why Jesus says, when the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith on earth? Because the coming of Christ will be an overwhelming surprise, not only to the world, but to many in the church. And that's how it was at his first coming. This is why we need to be diligent Bible students and to study the prophecies, because we have also a more sure word of prophecy, where you do well that you take heed as a light. It shines in a dark place until the day dawn and day star arise in your heart, which is referring to the second coming of Christ. So the question is this, what is it referring to? And this is the cover of the book by the Greek finance minister, Yanis Vakoufaris. He wrote this after an event which took place in 2008, and he says here, the 2008 financial crisis left the world economy in a state of what? Aporia, the same exact word as the disciple Luke uses. Same exact word. And this is what he writes. This is actually the very first page of his book, and I'm not going to read everything for time's sake. He said the very first sentence, right off the bat, nothing humanizes us like what? Aporia. And he uses that word continuously throughout the chapter. The same thing. He says September 2008 was just such a moment. And when I give this part one message, and this is just review, we're going to start the main message right now, and I'm going to pick it up a little bit. This is from Oxford Dictionary talking about the usage of the word aporia from 1800 to almost present day. And what do you notice here? This is Oxford Dictionary. What do you notice here? The usage of the word aporia from 1800 to about almost present day. What do you notice? It spikes right before 2010. And if I show you in this sermon, I show you articles in newspapers and journals. Everyone's talking about aporia that took place in 2008. Everyone knows about it except who? Anyway, we leave that one for now. So in other words, everyone, even Oxford Dictionary is telling you that Jesus is coming soon. Even Oxford Dictionary, you see? And this is why if we don't give the message, the stones certainly will be crying out. So let's see here. I'm going to be struggling with this. So we suggest here that upon earth to of nations with perplexity came to pass only in our day, which Sister Way predicted was future from her time. She said, in the future there will be, you see? And this is why the Bible says, quench not the spirit, despise not prophesizing, what? Prove all things, hold fast to that which is good, you see? So we, this is what we suggest. And this is when Luke says that the coming of the Lord is what? Nigh at hand, and that now this present generation shall not pass till all be fulfilled. You know, in the book Habakkuk, and also the apostle Paul wrote in Acts chapter 13, quoting the prophet Habakkuk, 
who prophesies of the coming judgments of Babylon in 586. Paul quoted him and he said, quoting the Lord, the Lord speaking, I will work a work in your days, a work in which you will no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. Just consider those words. So basically what we have here now, and so we're going to begin today's message right now. I'm going to, looking at my time, I think I began around like 12.30 or so, so I'm going to keep an eye on that. We're going to start in Revelation chapter 10. Now Revelation chapter 10 actually is an important book in the Bible because it talks about the beginning of the Advent movement. It talks about an angel coming down from heaven, a mighty angel coming down from heaven, clothed with a cloud and a rainbow was upon his head and his face was as the, fa as the sun and his feet were as pillars of fire. And he had a little book in his hand. And we know that little book was the book of Daniel. And he had one foot in the sea and also one in the land. And it was a worldwide message that was actually given at that time. And we know that it was at that time that the first and second angel's messages was being given. And they were correct in terms of their calculations, but they were wrong as to the event. They were tripped up in the idea that the earth was the sanctuary, but that was not the case. So the message was sweet in their mouth, but also it was bitter in their stomach. And the angel told the apostle John that he had to go prophesize again because one of the angel's messages that was not being given and was not being given in 1844 was what message? It was the third angel's message. So the third angel's message up to that time was not actually being given. In fact, we're going to see that in 1844, the third angel's message was a peculiar trial to the believers, and it wasn't until 1848 that the message started going forth after certain truths were better understood, like the Sabbath, the seal of God, and the mark of the beast. Because without those truths, it's hard to preach the third angel's message if you can't warn a person to not receive the mark of the beast, if you don't know what it is. And they weren't even keeping the Sabbath then, so you didn't know what the seal of God was, so the third angel's message was not ready to be given as of that time. And we're going to see that just as Revelation 10 talks about the rise of the first and second angel's message, like in verse 3 of Revelation 10, it talks about the seven thunders, right? Which is a delineation of events which transpired on the first and second angel's message. We're going to see that the book of Joel talks about the rise and progress of the third angel's message. And that's what the title of this sermon is. The rise and progress of the third angel's message and the book of Joel. And just as... We're going to talk about the book of Joel actually momentarily right now. So I don't want to get to that too soon. But this is what we read here in Early Writings, page 254. As the ministration of Jesus closed in the holy place, right? That was in 1844. And he passed into the holiest and stood before the ark containing the law of God. He sent another mighty angel, right? With a third message to the world. So when Jesus passed from the holy to the most holy, he sent the third angel to the believers. But we know that, of course... They could have easily have always read the third angel's message, but what Jesus was sending to them was an understanding of the third angel's message so it can be proclaimed, you see? Amen. This took place in 1844, and we're going to see it wasn't until 1848 that things really started to pick up. And we read here, from 1844 until the clear light of the third angel's message was a peculiar trial, because for the reasons which I mentioned, they didn't know the other truths, so you really can't preach the third angel. In 1844, the third angel's message was as the light of the sun rising over the horizon, its broad distinct disk was not seen yet. So in 1844, the third angel's message was likened to the sun, which was over the horizon. You couldn't see it. But its light was coming up over the horizon. But in 1848, the third angel's message was likened to the sun at noonday, in which it was seen in all its glory, and it was just shedding light everywhere. That was in 1848. I'll show you that momentarily. So this is why it was a difficulty for the believers. In fact, Elder Himes in 1847 said, the first and second angel's message belong to this generation. The third angel's message is an astounding cry, what? Yes. Yet to be made as a warning to mankind. So even in 1847, it wasn't even really being given. It started in 1848 because you have to fully understand not only certain truths, but the Sabbath the sealing message you have to understand. So these things were not known by the believers at the time. You know, they were Adventists, but not Seventh-day Adventists. Now, when they realized that the sanctuary was in heaven and Jesus moved from the compartment, the holy compartment, to the most holy, they followed by Jesus in faith into the most holy place. And in the most holy place is, of course, what? What article of furniture is there? 
the Ark of the Covenant, the commandments, and as they did so in faith, their attention was directed to the tablets of stone, the commandments, including which commandment? The fourth commandment. And Sister White also, as I'll show you momentarily, had a vision in 1846 of a halo surrounding the Sabbath commandment. She at first was not sure about whether we even have to keep the Sabbath, but the Lord showed her in vision that that wasn't certainly the case. And the thing to consider, too, is that the Apostle John, when he's writing the book of Revelation, was there an actual temple or sanctuary in Jerusalem? When John wrote... There was none, exactly, there was none. So when he says in Revelation 11, 1, right after the disappointment of Revelation 10, Revelation chapter 11, verse 1, right after Revelation 10 and the angel explains to them their disappointment, Revelation 11, 1 starts off, and unto me was given a reed like unto a rod, and the angel said, Arise, measure the temple and the altar, and them that worship therein. So what temple is he referring to then? Is the one in heaven. So here the Apostle John is encouraging the believers after their disappointment in 10, reading Revelation 11, look up towards the sanctuary in heaven. You see? Amen. And this is why that's right after the great disappointment of Revelation 10. Right after the disappointment, he starts off with the sanctuary in heaven. So they're trying to get the disappointed believers to look upward and not, of course, as the earth is being the sanctuary. And now we continue here, 1845, Elder Bates accepted the Sabbath, 1846, as I said, Sister White had that vision regarding the Sabbath in the uh, most holy place there. And then in 1847, she was given in vision, I'm not going to read it, what constituted the what? Mark of the beast. So with these truths, the third angel's message started falling into place. It started making sense, you know? Because if you're going to say, watch out for the mark of the beast, right? And you, and you ask me, what's the mark of the beast? I'm like, I don't know. It doesn't really help, you know? It doesn't really help at all. So in other words, in 1848, Sister White was given a vision what regarded the sealing message. In 1848, there was a total of seven Sabbath conferences. Great truths were unfolded. The pillars of the church were established. Amen. In 1848, at the seventh Sabbath conference in Dorchester, Massachusetts, Ellen White had a vision regarding the sealing truth. And with those three truths, the third angel's message made complete sense. And that's why it went forth in 1848. It was shining in all its glory. We're setting the f groundwork to now look at the book of Joel. And we're going to plug that in, and that'll be our message for today. So she had that vision at a meeting held in Dorchester, Massachusetts, November 1848. I had been given a view of the proclamation of the sealing message and of the duty of the brethren to publish the light that was shining upon our pathway. So the point of this slide is to actually show you that she was being given light regarding the sealing message. And remember that word published there, because it's going to come back later on. But this is what she was shown in vision. What was the sealing message and how the Sabbath tied into that as well, too. So in 1848, from Jane Loborough's book, was a memorable year in Adventism history. Why? Because the truths of the third angel's message was very well defined for the reasons which we said. And the way was opening in different directions for the advancement of the work. And Emerson's book, which is another book on the history of the church, in 1848, the Sabbath conferences, the work of the uniting the brethren on the great truths connected with the message of the third angel commenced. So that's when the message began, you see? And this is when the brethren started giving that message to the world with an understanding of what it was. Now, we're told the third angel's message is the theme of greatest importance. I'm going to stick with the highlighted portions for time's sake. It's the gospel message for these last days. It's the present truth for this time. The most terrible threatening ever born to man. So obviously, it's a very important message. If you want these slides, I can give it to you afterwards, so it's no problem. Don't stress. Um, so it's a very important message. It's of great importance. It's present truth. It's to embrace the first and second angel's message. It's the gospel message. And now, now, third angel's message, I'm going to get to that slide. Don't be scared. It's not meant to be seen, but I'll explain just one point I want to show on that slide there. The third angel's message, if any man worship the beast in his image or receive his mark in his forehead or his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture, into the cup of his indignation, right? And shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. So the third angel's message is a warning not to receive the mark of the beast. And if you do, what's going to happen? God's 
unmingled wrath will be poured out upon those who do, and that will be in the form of what? How will that judgment manifest itself? In the plagues, right? And then it says, will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels in the presence of the Lamb. So fire and brimstone, what does that kind of like point to? Hell. And that takes place when? After the thousand years. So it's a warning against receiving the plagues of God and of course the ultimate judgment of hell fire. So when do the plagues begin actually? At the close of probation, right? And as I said, fire and brimstone, hell fire takes place after the thousand years. Now this slide, I just want to point out one thing onto you. You have this at home probably. This is actually the close of probation here when the plagues start and Hell fires after the thousand years. And from point to point, if you look at the top, that time period is known as what? Time of the end. Time of the end starts in the Dark Ages. So, right. So, in other words, that started in the Dark Ages. So, what time period? The day of the Lord. The day of the Lord. Thank you. The day of the Lord. In other words, the day of the Lord starts with the plagues and ends at hell fire after the thousand years. So, in effect, the third angel's message is a warning against what? The day of the Lord. Right, someone said it. It's a warning against the day of the Lord. Because it warns against the plagues of God and hellfire, which comprises entirely, in its entirety, the day of the Lord. And believe it or not, that's actually what Sister White says. It's a warning against the day of the Lord. I'm not going to read that. These are the references just to show you that I'm just not making things up. These are the references. She says it's a warning against the day of the Lord for the reasons why we already mentioned so she continues now. Now, okay, so now besides Matthew and Luke and Mark, there are other books of the Bible that talk about the day of the Lord. And one of those other books is which other book? The book of Joel, okay? The book of, in fact, Joel talks about some of the same signs in the sun and the moon. So Jesus showed how these physical phenomena would be displayed in connection with the final day of the Lord, and Joel was focusing on the great day of the Lord as it might have been fulfilled with respect to the nation of Israel. So both talk about the day of the Lord, not only Luke 21 and Matthew 24, but Joel speaks. In fact, the theme of the book of Joel is the day of the Lord. When you actually look at the SDA commentary, I think it's volume four, it's volume four, page 938. The SDA commentary says that the book of Joel is a dissertation on the day of the Lord. So what's a dissertation? PhD, when you want to get a doctorate, you have to, you know, do a dissertation. It's a long essay, actually, right, for deep study, you know, to actually get your doctorate. You know, maybe some of you have obtained, you know, that, you know what it is. So it's theme, it's a dissertation on the day of the Lord. So it's a book that you just can't read over just once and be like, oh, I got that, no problem, you know? You have to study it. There's a lot there beneath the surface. It's about the day of the Lord. In fact, the book of Joel, as I said before, was a warning against the coming judgments of God, which came to place in 586 BC when Babylon came, right? Just the same way that Matthew 24 was a warning against the coming judgments of God in 70 AD by Rome. Do you see the parallel? These are types and shadows. And if the theme of the book of Joel is the day of the Lord, and the day of the Lord, as we know, has not yet transpired yet. Do you think the book of the Joel has something for us today just prior to the day of the Lord? Could it be possible? In other words, each of the ancient prophets spoke less for their own time and more for the ages to come, but especially for the generation Amen. which will witness the final events of earth's history. And what I'm going to do now is unfold to you the importance of the book of Joel for our day. And you're going to see now that it's talking about the rise and progress of the third angel's message and the completion of the work. This is what we're going to be taking a look at right now. These things are types and shadows. In fact, we know, I think it was the Apostle Paul who said, unto whom it is revealed that none unto themselves, unto us do they minister the things. And all the things that are written aforetime are written for our learning that we, through patience and comfort of the scripture, might have hope. You see, all these things were written as in samples for us. And I'm not going to go keep repeating and quoting those things, but you know them already. These things are for us today. They wrote more for our day, for even then their own, because what they went through were just shadows and types. We're seeing the substance, and we're going to see how Joel now speaks for our day, how it has become now present truth for our day in which we're living. We're going to apply it to and connect it with the third angel's message, and you're going to see something wonderful. 
Now, the book of Joel is three chapters long. Every chapter of it talks about the day of the Lord. Every chapter talks about the day of the Lord. In fact, it says this, Joel chapter 2, verse 1. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm in my holy mountain, let all the inhabitants of land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. Now, when you read this verse here, what catches your attention? And try not to look at the highlighted portion, which you probably already did. Where did you see that before? Where did you see those words before? Not the third angel's message. Where did you see the highlighted portion here? Those words, where did you see them before? Well, I see the book of Revelation differently. They don't like them differently. Okay, but also a verse which I had on the screen. Jesus said, right, when you see all these things come to pass, know that his coming is nigh at hand, even at the door, and then what? This generation shall not pass. In other words, Luke uses the same exact words as what just Joel does here. In fact, I think here it is, nigh at hand, you see? We cover Luke 21, we discuss these things, right? Upon earth, the stress of nations of perplexity, nigh at hand. So in other words, Joel declares when the coming of the Lord is nigh at hand, and also Luke uses the same thing. Now, if the Bible is reliable and God is consistent, right? Amen. What might you expect? Luke declared that the coming of the Lord was nigh at hand in what year? What event took place in 2008 to declare that the coming of the Lord was nigh at hand? But, and then what year was that? 2008. Now, do you think that Joel might just declare when the coming of the Lord is nigh at hand at some other point in time in history that doesn't concur or agree with the other gospel writers? Remember what the Apostle Paul wrote? At the mouth of two or three witnesses shall the matter or every word be established. Could it be possible that there's something in Luke or rather, something in the book of Joel that also indicates when the coming of the Lord is nigh at hand, and could it be in agreement with what the Apostle Luke says and what we've already plainly stated? Could it agree? Is the Bible reliable? We're going to put God to the test and see if Joel declares that the coming of the Lord is nigh at hand at the same time which we said from Luke chapter 21. We're going to put God to the test and see if this actually comes to pass. Okay? Let's see, because we know that at the mouth of two or three witnesses, the matter shall be established. Or as Paul says, every word shall be established. Now, this is what is written in this book that I have here, and also Sister White. God, by Joel, commanded when the great day of God should be at hand. Sister White says the same thing. As the Lord commanded by the prophet Joel when the great day of God should be at hand. So when something is commanded, it's authoritative. In other words, I would hope that Joel declares the coming of the Lord is nigh at hand at the same time as Luke, because here it says that God by Joel commanded when it should be at hand. So at the very least, I would hope that it would agree with what Luke has to say that we talked about already. So let's take a look at that. Now, again, as I said, this is part two to the very first message I gave here. I always can re-give that message later on or cover it any time or even send it to you by PowerPoint. You can review it as well too. So let's take a look at that. So now look, let's look at Joel and we're gonna finish this message actually now. Joel says this, Joel chapter 1 verse 2, Hear this, ye old men, and give ear, all ye inhabitants of the land. Has this been in your day or even the days of your fathers? Now, what message is this referring to? What is he talking about? What event is he talking about? When I say to you, hey, hear this, does that give you any information? No, you're like, well, what is this? What is it talking about, you know? So we have to look and see what Joel is actually talking about. What does this mean? What is the message? What is the event that he's even talking about? What is he mentioning here? What message are the people to hear and give ear to? What event is the verse here referring to? What event had not been in their day or the day of their fathers? So we're going to break down Joel. Remember, Joel is a dissertation on the day of the Lord. It's not something you can just read, oh yeah, I got that, no problem. It's not, it's, you have to dig into it a little bit. You have to go beneath the surface a little bit, okay? So here, we're going to look at it. We're going to break it down, and I'm going to do it the shortest way possible. Joel chapter 2, Joel 1 verse 2. Hear this, old man, and get here, all ye inhabitants of the land. Has this been in your day or even the days of your father? So Joel is talking about an unprecedented calamity, an event unheard of by the fathers. Devastation by a plague of locusts, a coming judgment that would be unparalleled in intensity and totality. So in other words, when 
Joel is writing this, the only way he could describe how bad it's going to be is that he goes back to the book of Exodus and borrows the language that Moses used. He's like, this is going to be so bad. The only thing I can compare this to are the plagues in Egypt. So he refers to the plagues in Egypt. So the book of Joel refers to plagues and coming judgments that would be unlike anything in intensity and totality. An unprecedented calamity is coming. This is the message of Joel thus far. In fact, the message was to be given, you know, here it says, hear this, old men, give ear, all in heaven's land. Has this been in your days or even the days of your fathers? He borrows the language from Exodus. This has not even been in the days of your fathers. So he keeps borrowing the language from Exodus to describe his message and his point. In fact, this, it goes on, the same thing. Tell your children and their children, the next generation and their children, another. Again, tell in thy heirs of thy sons and of thy sons' sons. So he's paralleling his message and coming judgment with the events that took place in Exodus under the plagues that transpired there, the ten plagues. And again, Joel 1.14, we see here, sanctify ye fast and call a solemn assembly. Gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God and cry unto the Lord. Alas, for the day of the Lord is at hand as a destruction from the Almighty it shall come. So it's a warning against what? The day of the Lord. It's a, so now we're just trying to get pieces from this book of Joel, which is a dissertation on the day of the Lord, to see what his theme is and what that message is when he says, hear this. What is he referring to? Blow the trumpet in Zion, sound alarm in my holy mountain, let all the inhabitants of the day tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. So it's a trumpet message, an alarming message, a message for all the inhabitants of the land or the world. The day of the Lord approaches. So the question I ask is this. Okay, so this is what I already quoted, so I'm not going to actually refer to it too much. We have to remember, each of the ancient prophets wrote more for our time even than their own. And because the day of the Lord has not even transpired yet, we know that Joel's writings speak more for our day than even in the time in which he wrote them. You see? So now we're going to apply them to present truth and the times in which we live and see what message does Joel have for us today, okay? And you're going to see something very fascinating. Just bear with me here because I'm setting the groundwork and I have to do this and we have to kind of go over church history. It's important to do so. Remember what Solomon said, right? That which hath been is that, you know, the thing that hath been is that which shall be and that which is done is that which shall be done. And there's no new thing under the sun. So we have to go back in history to kind of study these things out and to see what the history of the pioneers wants. So we see that each of the prophets wrote less for their own time and more for our day. So the question is here, when did Joel speak for our own day? When did this verse become present truth? What event or message in our day refers to this verse? So in other words, the question is this, what message do we have today, right, that refers to an event unheard of by the fathers that warns against the day of the Lord which makes a reference to plagues. It warns against receiving the plagues of God. It warns against receiving the coming judgments of God and that it would be unparalleled in intensity and totality. What message do we have that talks about unprecedented calamity is to be addressed to all the inhabitants of the land. What message do we have today that we're to blow a trumpet to and sound an alarm? And what message do we have today that we are to hear and to give ear to? Is there any message that we have today that kind of like covers that? The third angel's message, right? Would you think so? We covered the third angel's message. The third angel's message covers all of this. And we're going to see, as Revelation 10 talks about the rise and progress of the first and second angel's message, the book of Joel talks about the rise and progress of the third angel's message. And this is why it's important to know these things, because this is about to transpire in our day. So the third angel's message, we know that everything's at stake. The third angel's message is of the highest importance. It's a life and death question. It's the most prominent warning. It's of the utmost consequence to the world. I have these references here. I can give you the slides. I won't read them for time's sake. I don't want to go over my time. So this is what she says regarding it. It's the theme of greatest importance. It's the gospel message for these last days. So what we suggest, okay, now this is actually from the Watchman, June 18th, 1907. In fact, Sister White quotes Joel chapter two, verse one. She says this, sound an alarm throughout the length and breadth of the land. Tell the people that the day of the Lord is near and hasteth greatly. And then she says this, let none be left unwarned, having heard the what? Solemn warning of the third angel. We are debtors to others to impart to the truth to them. So she connects the message of Joel with what message? 
the third angel. So she spells it out for you. But you see, if we were studying our Bibles, we could have came to this deduction without even having the spirit of prophecy. But God gave it to us to do what? To confirm the truths, you see? This is why, and she confirms it. She confirms what we tried to just figure out. You see that? So we're, right, we're on the right track, right? So let's take a look at this. Remember, that commenced in 1848. So that's the starting date that we need to keep in mind. Because why? That's when the third angel started. She was given the message of the sealing message, and the light was shining upon their pathway. Again, just to reiterate, it was 1848. That door was open, and it showed a marked and steady growth in that same year. Okay, So we have to remember that date, because that was a very important day in Adventist history, as I showed you before, and also what's documented in this book. So that's an important date to know. So we are suggesting this, that Joel chapter 1, verse 2 is this became present truth and spoke for our own time in 1848 with the commencement of the third angel's message. So Joel started speaking for our day in our time when the third angel's message started being proclaimed because it has the same themes, it's the same message, and this is when Joel spoke for our day. His theme is the day of the Lord, and it's to be very soon in the future, so he's speaking more for our time even than his own. So this is what we're suggesting here. Now, Joel chapter 1, verse 3, the next verse, says, Tell ye your children of it, and let your children tell their children, and their children another generation. So that's four generations. What's the significance of the four generations? We're going to cover just momentarily. When did this verse become present truth, and what starting date can we give it? Because we want to, we're going to see that the history of Joel started repeating itself in our day at the time of the pioneers at the commencement of the third angel's message. That's when Joel's writing started becoming in effect and started really having direct meaning for warning against the day of the Lord. It wasn't back in 1800 BC when he wrote the book. And what he was writing for was the type which occurred in 586 with the destruction of Jerusalem by Babylon. But he wrote more for our day and the history of Joel started repeating itself in our day with the history of the pioneers at the commencement of the third angel's message if you understand that. So what is this verse here referring to? Tell ye. Now to tell something means to say or to write, to speak or to give in writing, okay? Now that word is kafar in the original Hebrew language. It means to inscribe, to record, to record or scribe, to inscribe as a permanent record, to write as in stone. In other words, it's a permanent record, okay? It means to hear. That's what it hears. Inscribe means to write or print as a formal or permanent record to set down in writing. Now, this is just a definition here. Inscribe means formal or permanent record. That's just for your own benefit. And that's also what it says here. To inscribe as in letters of stone. So the scribe, we don't really use them anymore. At the hospital, they do. When doctors are really busy, they have a scribe there, which just actually types out what they say because they're too busy doing things, like in the emergency room. They don't have time to write. They're just busy going from room to room checking out patients, you know? So they use scribes. But for the most part, do we use scribes anymore? No. What work has overtaken the job or occupation of scribes today? Printing, publishing. We don't do it. So publishing, the in, now is the internet. But you know, at the time of the pioneers, we're going to see, and remember that I showed you that one word on the previous slide, the publish? publish. That's going to come back. It's going to come back. In other words, we don't really use them so much anymore. It lost most of its importance with the status of the advent of printing. So the question I ask is this. At what point in the history of the church did the pioneers begin to publish, print, write, inscribe, produce a formal or permanent record? Tell, declare, or show forth. I kind of gave away the answer before, but what year do you think that took place in? 1848. You see, the history of Joel started repeating itself in the day of the pioneers, with the commencement of the third angel and with the work of the publishing ventures. And that's exactly what we have here. Sister White's book on, guess what? The publishing ministry in chapter 1 talks about 1848. Amen. The history started repeating itself, and this is why it's important to study what? History, that which hath been is now, and that which is to be hath already been, and God requires that which is what? Past. He requires us to have an understanding of past history. Why? Because history repeats itself. History is not linear, but so much as it is what? Circular, you see? History may not necessarily repeat itself exactly, but it often rhymes, you see? And this is why it's important to study history. This is why God said, go over your history. 
Go over your history. So in other words, in 1848 in Dorchester, Sister Oi was given the sealing message, and then guess what? As according to Joel, the publishing work started, the light that was shining upon her pathway. It was after this vision that Miss White informed her husband of his duty to what? Publish. And that's when she told him, her husband, what? To write, write, write. After coming out of vision, I said to my husband, I have a message for you. You must begin to do what? Print a little paper and send it to the people. The Lord would not have given him strength to labor in the fields, for he had another work for him to do, and that if he ventured into the field, he would be cut down by sickness, but that he must write, write, write. And any time a thing is mentioned three times, you know it's significant. There's only a few things she says three times, like educate, 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 write, write, write. So this is an important point in church history, and that's why she repeated it, because it's emphatic. And when God says something once, that's enough for me. But three times, I said, mercy, you better listen. So he immediately began to write. And we know that in 1849 came out the very first volume one, number one, published in Middletown, Connecticut. In fact, I work in Middletown, Connecticut at Middlesex Hospital. And whenever I walk on Main Street, I'm like, wow, I walked on the same street that Brother James White walked on. He lived in Rocky Hill, you know? Of course, it was dirt roads back then, but still, it still counts for me. But anyway, so in other words, this came out in 1849, the year after, but the publishing ventures began in 1848. You see? So the the third angel's message is to what? Be given by pen and voice. The third angel's message is to what? Be given in publications and discourses. This is what she says, and that is exactly what happened in church history. In 1848, when it was known what the third angel was, it went everywhere. Why? Because of the publishing work. You see? Amen. This is how Joel started speaking for our day. History was repeating itself. Do you see it? Yes. History is repeating itself. What you're going to see next is I think I praise the Lord for it. And I know that what the Lord showed me, I know this is from God because man can't come up with this. And I'm going to show you this. this is, so tell ye this publishing work, when did it speak for our day? In 1848 with the first publishing ventures at the same time that the third angel's message commenced. I'm going to skip this slide. That's we cover that. So now the four generations. What do the, you've always heard about the four generations of Joel, right? I mean, ever since we came in Adventist, you know about the four generations of Joel, you know? So what is the importance of this? And this is fascinating. I mean, if you don't listen to me at all for this whole sermon, just listen for the next five minutes. This is really, oh, don't get ahead of me, Brother Frank. Don't get ahead of me. In other words, tell your children of it and let your children tell their children and their children another generation. I never gave this message here, but I did write about it, so you cheated. But that's okay, though. That's no problem, though. You get credit. You get credit. You get credit. So in other words, tell your children of it. So the four generations, how do we apply to this today? Remember, Joel says when the day of the Lord should be what? Nigh. Nigh at hand. And the question we presented was, could it possibly agree with what author of Scripture? Luke, in chapter 21, verse 25, he said, when the day of the Lord should be nigh at hand, right? So let's see if it agrees, because God by Joel commanded when it should be at hand. So you know, I'm starting to sweat. I'm like, you know, maybe, like, I'm hoping it agrees with Luke because otherwise something is wrong. So God is putting himself out on the line here a little bit, you know? So let's see. Let's see if what Joel says, the day of the Lord, if it's at nigh at hand, at which time Luke says so. Let's take a look at it. So God by Joel commanded when it should be at hand. I read this slide already just for your recollection. Now, Luke, as I said, 2131, when is this to be nigh at hand? We said that it was in 2008. So could Joel possibly agree? Because if it doesn't agree, you have to go back to the drawing board. It's the same language. And not only that, Zephaniah also declares when the coming of should be nigh at hand. And that is a theme. Its theme is the day of the Lord. And he also agrees with what these two say. And that's why the Bible says, at the mouth of two or three witnesses shall the matter every word be established. See, God does not leave himself without witness, you see. Amen. Where he says one thing in one part of the Bible, he confirms it in the other, you see. Amen. So we can have that assurance. And that's why the Bible says we have a more sure word of prophecy. We're going to do well that you take heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your heart, which is what? The second advent of Christ, you Amen. see. So the Bible is consistent, you know? You don't really have to go to figure it out too much there. So what is this referring to? Now, the starting date, we said, was what year? 1848. So here we have four generations. Now, according to the Bible, 
how many years is a generation? 40, right? Numbers 32, 13, when Jesus gave his discourse in Matthew 24 and 31 AD, he said, this generation shall not pass till Jerusalem be destroyed. It was destroyed in 70 AD. And if you just do the math, 31 to 70 is how many years? 39. Did it pass the generation? No, because the generation's 40 years. God's mercy waited to the very, very end. And then he said, okay, judgment. You see? A generation's 40 years. So if the publishing work is to go forward for four generations, how many years is that publishing work to go on for? 160. 160. And what was our starting date? 1848. And what date do you think we arrive at? This is when the day of the Lord is at hand. You see? This is why the Bible says here, and Sister White actually mentions, God by Joel commanded when the day of the Lord should be at hand. In other words, he's commanding it. It's a theme. It's a dissertation on the day of the Lord. Do you know that this is a privileged generation? You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that should show forth the praises of him that called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Amen. Do you see the light shedding upon your way? You are a privileged generation. You have the privilege of finishing the work. And I say this on the, upon the authority of the Bible and spirit of prophecy, that unless God calls you to sleep, because he may for few, you will live to see the coming of Christ. And that's why we, as the first group did at Christ's first coming, had the assurance through the prophecies that their generation would see the coming Messiah. So likewise, we, through a study of prophecy, would have the assurance as to whether or not we're living in the generation, which would not his first coming, but what? His second coming. There's nothing to discuss. There's nothing to argue about. You either accept it or you don't. That's it. There's nothing to talk about. You know? There's nothing. To, God says, my sheep hear my voice. Everyone that is of the truth heareth what? My voice. That's what the Lord says. And this is Jesus' words. Amen. We don't know the day of the hour, but on the authority of the Bible, right, this generation is going to finish the work. God. And the question is, are you going to be part of it? Amen. You know, are you going to be part of it? You have to ask yourself, do you want to be part of it? 2008, God by Joel commanded when it should be at hand. Luke and Joel both agree. Now, the question I have is this. We have the four generations, and then, of course, the day of the Lord is at hand in 2008. Now, the question I ask is this, and then we're going to finish up right now. I'm approaching an hour. Ancient Israel was in Egypt for how many generations? God told Abraham that his seed would be in Egypt for how many generations? But in the fourth generation, they shall come out hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. So in other words, ancient Israel was in Egypt for four generations. Levi, Kohath, Amran, and Moses brought them out of Egypt, right? So it's four generations. So ancient Israel was in Egypt for four generations. And then what came while they were in Egypt? What actually transpired? The plagues, right? And then they went into earthly Canaan. So likewise, spiritual Israel, not ancient Israel, will be in the world for what? Four generations, right? And then will come the coming plagues, and they will enter into not earthly Canaan, but what? Heavenly Canaan. You see? These are why history is important, because just as ancient Israel was in Egypt for four generations, then came the plagues, then they actually went into earthly Canaan. So spiritual Israel will be here for four generations, right? Then will come the plagues, and then they will enter not to earthly, but heavenly Canaan. You see? So history repeats itself. And what generation of Adventism are we in right now? 2008 marked the fourth generation. So we're in the fifth generation. This means that we here of spiritual Israel will enter into not earthly Canaan, but what? Yeah. Heavenly Canaan, you see? And are you making those preparations? Do you want to receive that seal of God that we were talking about before? Because none except those who fully reflect the image of Christ will receive that seal and finish the work. Amen. It's a high calling that we a lot to strive for. So the work is going to be finished by this generation. That's it. Nothing more to discuss. You know, I imagine that when Simeon was told by the Holy Spirit that he would see the Lord's Christ until, you know, he would not see death, right? Imagine someone came up to him and said to him, you know, Simeon, I know that you're a very pious person. You're always in the temple. You're always praying. But 
you know, no man knows the day of the hour, you know, no man knows, we can't be sure, we can know the seasons, but we don't know. I imagine Simeon would say, but Jesus is coming. Amen. And someone would say, you know, Simeon, you know, you're kind of getting up there in age and perhaps the cognitive things are not flowing, you know, and he would say, Jesus is coming. In other words, there was nothing to talk about. You either took it or you didn't. That's it. Done. I'm finished. And I can finish the sermon here right now. There's nothing to discuss. That's it. God does not leave himself without witness. At the mouth of two or three witnesses. And I can preach to you on Zephaniah. When he says it's at it, and it agrees. He talks about four generations. In Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 1, he, makes, he talks about his generation for four posterity in the past, and he makes himself the fifth generation. Zephaniah does. You see? Likewise, he agrees with what we're talking about, but we're not going to cover it today. In other words, the four generations, this is it here. So Sister White says, as ancient Israel pitched their tents towards Egypt, right? So many people today, spiritual Israel, are conforming to the world. In other words, Egypt is a type of the world. So as ancient Israel was in Egypt, so spiritual Israel is in what? The world. You see? So likewise. And then the place came for both, and then one went into earthly Canaan, while the other goes into heavenly Canaan. We're that fifth generation. So you, now you have to deal with that. You see? You have to figure out what you're going to do. You know? You can't keep going through the motions of religion, because God is going to pass by whole churches that really don't cooperate with him. You see? And I'm hoping and praying that Toll and Church will be part of the closing work. And if that's your decision, you know, we're going to pray about that just momentarily. And we get back to, this is my, I think my last slide actually here. I don't know if I can get back to that last slide. I think I lost it. Okay, here we go. So this is it. And then this is my last slide and I think we're done. But when is this kingdom to be established? Do you think we answered that today? May we hope for an answer to an inquiry of such momentous concern to our race. These are the very questions on which the word of God does not leave us in ignorance. And here is seen the surpassing value of this heavenly boon. We do not say the exact time is revealed. We emphasize the fact that it is not, either in this or in any other prophecy. But so near an approximation is given that the generation which is to see the establishment of this kingdom may mark its approach unerringly. In other words, it's a no-brainer. You don't even have to think. You just have to sit there and listen. That's it. A child can understand this, you see? And make those preparations which will entitle them to share in all its glories. You know, I think about the words of the Apostle Paul, and I think they apply more to us now than even the time in which he wrote those words. Five minutes. No, no, no I'm not saying for that. Oh. I was wondering, because you just stay pretty much the rest of the day, would you mind coming? Yeah, we, we can cover it, no problem. This is why I wanted to make time and, this, and let me tell you something. This message was supposed to be given in last winter here. Yeah. I was canceled because of a snowstorm. I think like the plow guy just quit working that same week. <laughs> and then I was plugged in for two more appointments. One was canceled. The other one was canceled. You know? And this was on my heart to give you this message. In the fullness, God has made everything beautiful in his time. You see? Amen. Amen. But I'll tell you, it wasn't fun waiting. You know? But anyway, the words of the Apostle says this. The words of the Apostle Paul says this. And that, knowing the time, now it is high time to wake out of sleep. For now is the salvation nearer than we believed. Paul wrote more for even our day with regards to that, even than his own. Of course, he could have had in mind the type of destruction of Jerusalem, but we're going to see the substance, the, the antitype of it all which is the day of the Lord coming, you see? Yes. And this is why Jesus' theme when he came, Desire of Ages, page 233, when Jesus preached, the theme or the burden of his message was this. The time is fulfilled, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, repent and believe the gospel. Amen. That was the theme. The time is fulfilled. Jesus spoke of Daniel chapter 9. The Messiah is coming in your day. And was his message received? No. Why? Because they told, no man knows the day or the hour. They missed the boat, you see? And he was trying to explain to them certain time-sensitive present truths which they did not receive. And that's how it will be as it was at his first coming, so it will be at his second coming. The first and second angels' messages, even in the days of the pioneers, was not very popular. It wasn't very well received. And likewise, the third angel's message, as it pertains to the book of Joel, will likewise not be received as well by the majority. 
But nonetheless, it's still true. You see? And this is why the prophet Habakkuk said, and Paul quoted him, I will work a work in your days, a work in which you will no wise believe, though a man, though a man declare it to you. We'll leave it there. And I'm sure you have plenty of questions. I'll be more than happy to answer them. If you want the PowerPoint, I'll be happy to share that with you as well, too. But my friends, we're living in momentous times. And God is gathering his number, even his 144,000. We're to strive to be amongst that group. The coming of the Lord truly, indeed, is at hand. He's at the door, and he's coming soon. This generation, not just 